Welcome in, friends, to another episode of the A-List Podcast. I'm Kwani Lunas. As always, I'm joined by H. Trout Blakely and Gary Washburn. How are you two doing? Wonderful. Life Wonderful. is good. Yeah? Life is good. Gary? <laughs> Everything is good. Everything is good. Very yeah? good. You're, you're excited that basketball's fully back in action? Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, think... it's still preseason, but... Yeah, I mean, we're cranking up in the storylines and good to see, you know... Uh, some guys in action last night, Kawhi, and mm-hmm. Ben Simmons for the first time in, in a while, and Kyrie looking like he's engaged, he's ready, ready to ball. So, yep. yeah, it was, it's definitely, um, it's good to be back. It's, you know, it's getting there two weeks from the season opener. Before we know it, exactly. But you mentioned being back in action, obviously, but the Celtics, they had their first preseason game on Sunday. But the bigger storyline, I think, other than them blowing out the Hornets, which we'll talk about. But the signing of Blake Griffin is the big one. He's the addition, clearly, last two seasons he played in Brooklyn. What was your, both of you, initially, what did you think about this addition to the lineup, knowing the lack that the Celtics have right now in depth? I'm going to take more of a wait and see on, on Blake, because when I think about Blake now versus the totality of his career, it's a very different outlook. Uh, when I see Blake now, the first person that comes to mind is Shaquille O'Neal. Uh, okay. Not so much as far as like Shaquille O'Neal came to Boston at the end of his career. That's mm-hmm. not what I think of. I think about Shaquille O'Neal in a studio watching Jason Tatum put in at work while Blake is guarding him and start saying, barbecue chicken, yeah. barbecue chicken. And that's what I think about Blake. I mean, he, he did not play particularly well when he was in Brooklyn. And again, you don't expect, you know, six-time All-Star Blake. But it just seemed that there were his game had really, really, really taken a downward spiral. Uh, but if you're the Celtics, you look at your roster and you look who's available. And Blake, even in his you know downgraded state, is probably better than most of the guys that they have. Uh, to me, the key is going to be how will guys like Sam Hauser, you know, and and Fiondu and some of the other guys, you know, you know Noah Vonley, a guy that I, I really like a lot. How will they? challenge Blake in terms of minutes played uh, because they're a little bit younger, a little bit more spry, a little more bouncing, you know, more pep in a step than he has, but he's got old man wisdom on his side. He's a smart, heady player. And Gary, I know that was something that you were harping on a lot the last few weeks when it seemed that they needed to add something. And I know you were really uh, kind of really bullish on them adding a veteran. So I'm I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are on on Blake. Mm -hmm. I think it's a good addition like what I prefer probably Carmelo. Yeah, because of his ability, Carmelo. His oh ability to score, his, his ability to score and help them offensively. But they need some bulk in the paint. Like you got Al Horford, Robert Williams out for three months, likely. He's we're not gonna see him until the first of the year. And you got Luke Cornett and then you know Fiondu Kevin Gelly and then Noah Vonley. Yeah, got it right. Uh, I told you when, when the season comes. I'm gonna play by the time preseason starts. Yeah, I told you. So that a stone kicking in. I see. Okay. Uh, the uh, the um, so the, for me, like, I just think a veteran leader. He knows. I, I was very impressed by what he told us yesterday. Like he he knows he's not Blake 2010 2015. Not even 2017 when he made last week the All Star game, mm-hmm. but he averaged like 25 for the pit for Sherrod's Pistons. Like he knows he's not that guy. Now, uh, can he help them? He can shoot better from the perimeter. He's obviously taken way more threes in recent years than he did with his Clipper years. He can rebound. He can D. He can take a charge. You know. Now, do you want him guarding? You know. Kevin Durant, Giannis Antetokounmpo, uh, you know, on the perimeter, no. But hopefully, if you're the Celtics, you don't put him in that position to where he's exposed that way. I remember Marcus Smart had a really interesting comment after they beat Detroit about basically, like, Blake is not the defender of the player he once was. And so I don't think they're asking him for a lot. I just think they're asking for leadership. Bulk in the paint, score at the rim, get to the free throw line. He can instantly, I mean, that one game they threw him into the playoffs, he impacted that game. Now, did they target him defensively? Yes, they did. But I think the Celtics feel like their defense is good enough. This is not Brooklyn's defense, right? This is the Celtics defense. You don't expose him like that. 
and have him ISO one on one with literally Paul George or Kawhi or guys that can just get go to the rack on him. So they're going to have to defi- they'll, they'll protect him. But I thought it was a good sign. They needed someone else besides Al in terms of leadership, in terms of someone who can, you know, th- th- those guys know him. They've seen him dunk over people. They've seen what he can do. There's an admiration there. Those guys were, you know, watching from their houses, their they uncle's basement or whatever, when he was dunk, <laughs> jumping over a Kia. So yeah. they know who he okay. is. Yeah. And sometimes that name recognition, and, and it's not like Blake's like, okay, I need to start. Okay, I need to play 30 minutes. He's not coming in like that. He, he wants to stay in the league. I mean, I think that unfortunately – for a lot of those guys in that generation, you know, look at the guys that are still at home. Carmelo, LaMarcus Aldridge, Dwight Howard, and DeMarcus Cousins, and, and plenty of others. Isaiah, our friend Isaiah Thomas. Like, that generation, those guys who were 32, 33 now, are getting nudged out the league. Blake's like, I'm going to get in where I fit in. If I got to be a leader and play eight minutes a game or get a rebound, a tough board, and give our team, that's what I'm going to do. Because he wants to win a chip and he knows he's not what he once was. I think that's a good thing for him to be. He said self-awareness is key is how he keeps himself in the league. And a lot of, as I said, we, we know, and Sherrod can tell you more like about Allen Iverson or guys who didn't ever want to admit that they had lost a step or they were a different player and then didn't want to adjust their games. And Carmelo was almost out the league for that same reason. Like you're not what you were, adjust to it. And you can stay in the league. No, that's a really good point. I love that you bring up the the respect factor because when Rick, Blake Griffin brought up, all, the first thing people talked about on Twitter was like, oh, he's washed up. I, I mean, I personally thought about his Piston days and I was like, but toward the end of his time in Detroit, he wasn't looking too good. And, you know, obviously in Brooklyn, the same. So the fact that there is this level of respect, he is still a former number one overall pick. Like he has the talent, I think that experience is going to be very important for this locker room. But I think another thing that's very telling that he said to the media a few days ago was the fact that this locker room was surprisingly welcoming and it was different from locker rooms that he's been used to. What do you two make of those comments? Gary. Oh, obviously I think that's kind of a shadow was going on in Brooklyn because he was there for all the chaos and the, Tuggle back and forth and with like Kyrie and Harden that, yeah. and KD. Like he was there for all that. And so he had to watch that. And, you know, everybody wants to run to Brooklyn for, oh, I'm going to try to win a chip. Mm-hmm. Aldridge did that. Goran Dragic did that. Like all these guys, I'm going to sign with the Nets. And it's a, it, it was a disaster last year for them, you know? And so I think Blake, I think Blake was definitely alluding to, uh, his Brooklyn days are like, wow, these dudes are young, but they want to play. They're harmonious. They get along together. They're happy. It's not a bunch of attitudes. It's not a bunch of get away from me's or I'm, a, you know, um, you know, I'll, I'll holler at you later. I'm a, I'll text you when I get home in, in terms of just get away from me. Don't talk to me. <laughs> you know, those things that these guys do, like it's not it's an old baseball term that I learned. Twenty five guys, twenty five cabs. You know, it, it's not uh, a bunch of individuals. It's a team. And I think that he was refreshed by that. I'm just guys, you know, probably patting him on the back. Hey, Blake, I remember this when you did that. Oh, man, good to meet you. Guys that didn't know him, guys that did know him. That, mm-hmm. you know, even though they know he's not what he once was, they had a good amount of respect for him still. And I think that's what he's looking for. So I think that was a telling quote in terms of the, um, you know, the, the kind of alluding that Brooklyn was a disaster it was it was it was it was it was it was terrible there for him. And, and I think just these guys are smart. They know what they're saying. He could have just not said that at all. To your point, yes, I think that was a, I, I, he meant to say that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And there's there's no question. There was a lot of intentionality with his comments, and, and understandably so. He went to Brooklyn like so many of those other cats to win a chip. Get a win, yeah. And then you get there and you realize that that one agenda item that you thought everybody was was at the top of their agenda list was not the case. You had others, you had some folks, you know, like Kyrie who wanted to do one thing. You had Kevin Durant thinking something else. You had, you know, Harden wondering like, damn, I, I, what? Y'all got me out of Houston for this? And then you got Blake, six-time All-Star, five-time All-NBA, rookie of the year, 
you know, on the back nine of his career. And he's looking around thinking like, I left Detroit for this. I mean, Detroit was by no means no basketball mecca. Mm-hmm. Uh, they struggled. And, and, and Blake understandably wanted out of there, which I, I totally get. But mm-hmm. the harmonious struggles in Detroit, I think, were a, would have been a welcome reprieve from the just the insane chaos and upheaval and, and just issues that that Brooklyn team had. And he comes to Boston. And not only are you playing with guys who seem to genuinely like being around each other, but they know how to win. And at this point, if you could, that's the best of both worlds. Give me a team that can, I can get a little burn, good guys, and they know how to win. I don't have to teach them how to win. I can, I can augment what they're doing. I don't have to put this team on my back. If Blake Griffin is carrying you, you're looking for that number one pick in the next year's draft. Uh, Mm -hmm. because that's about the only place at this point in his career he can carry a team to. Every now and then, he's going to have a flashback moment uh, where he's going to drop like 10 or 12 points in like six, seven, eight minutes. And he still has that ability in him. But you're going to see that few and far between uh, during his time in in Boston. But again, a lot of the lifestyle type things that players want at this point in their career, he's going to get that in Boston. And, you know, most important for him at this point is a chance to win. Uh, It's not about the next payday. It's not about you know, out dueling this guy or that guy. It's about finding a way to win a championship in Boston. I don't know what his other options are, but I can't imagine he had a better opportunity to do that than if he came to Boston. And I think with this team being young, even the Pistons team that he was on was pretty young as well. And ironically enough, the team with the most experience is the one that looks like it was just going to combust at any moment because you do have so many egos. And I think with the Celtics team, Obviously, Jason and Jalen have that confidence of being stars, but they still recognize real. They understand talent. They respect game. And I think they're still humble enough, so to speak, where they're going to let a veteran come in and influence the locker room in the way that they can. But with that, without that overshadowing the fact that they do still have a lot of skill, which is, I think, a hard thing to do in the NBA because there's so many egos. Yeah. Yeah. And, and and those two guys that you're talking about, Tatum and Brown, it's, you know, they, they kind of keep the, keep it simple. I'm going to do me, mm-hmm. you do you, let's go mm-hmm. win games. That That's pretty much their approach to this. They don't get caught up in a lot of the stuff that we in the media get entangled with and about, you know, who's better, Jalen or Jason? Yeah. Should, we, should they even be together? Can they, they do, they don't together? let on at all. <laughs> right. And they're just like, all right, whatever. Uh, they don't seem to be flustered or, or frustrated at all by a lot of that, that talk. And they just, at the end of the day, they just hoop. They just hooping, man. They just hooping. Overall, what are your expectations for Blake Griffin this year? Mm. Go, Gary. It's your boy. Just Everyone's a, the boy. Leadership, somebody who can play 10 to 12 minutes a game and maybe more if he flourishes on the floor. A guy can go, take a charge, play defense a little bit in the paint, get a tough rebound. Just a glue guy. You know, I think he understands he's not that guy anymore. He's not going to even, I mean, and it's pretty incredible. I mean, you know, four or five years ago, I mean, I, I, I was in person, what, drop, he dropped 44 in the Clippers in his first game against the Clippers after going to Detroit. I mean, he dropped 44, and that was like 2019. That was like January 19. So that was like three and a half years ago. So it wasn't like he's, you know, like he can't score anymore. He would just need to get to the line. Hit his three needs to be going down. So, but they don't need that from him. They need like six points, five rebounds, a steal, and a, two charges taken. That's what they need. They need glue. They got enough scores on the basketball team. They need a guy who can be steady and then also leader, a leader, like another guy who can pull guys aside, encourage them. You know, he'll have a good impact on Robert Williams. You know, he'll have a great impact, I think, on Grant Williams. You know, those guys who are young, who are literally, I mean, if you if you want to do the math, we can do the math because I like doing the math. You know, he that, that whole dunk contest, the key was 2011. And Grant was 13 years old and Robert Williams was 14. Like, they were like in middle school or high, about to be in high school when that was going on. So this is a dude like, wow, he's on my team now. Jason was 13 years old when that was going down. I think 13, about to turn 13. You sure, so, Gary? I think Jason was 19 then. No, yeah, he's still 19. You know, <laughs> I mean, shoot, Kawani was 18. So, uh, you know, you know, so a that's, a, that's a minute ago. That's a long yeah. ass time ago. Yeah. No, um, I'm being funny. 
Yeah. Uh, so those guys know him and they've known who, he, you know, they remember him from Oklahoma. He played against Joe Mazzula um, in college, you know, when Oklahoma played West Virginia. So to me, I mean, it, this is a really positive move because I think Blake Griffin has the right mindset. And I said, if you bring in Dwight Howard, maybe DeMarcus Cousins, Lamar, they might come in and expect to play more than they might. And then you don't want them to be a distraction. You don't want them pouting. You don't want them like, man, let me get my burn. I'm better than that dude. I don't think you're going to get that out of Blake. I think Blake just wants to play. He enjoys playing. He enjoys being remaining in the league. He's made over 250 million in his career. So, you know, I don't think money's a real issue for him. I just think he likes to play. And remember, he's only 33. Um, He's still, I mean, I'm almost 34. Like, he's still, you know, young for us, but he still has, you know, something left in his body. He's not completely, completely done. So, you know, he understands he's on the back nine of his career. So I think whatever they need, I think he'll provide. Maybe he can convince Jalen to uh, do the dunk contest. No, that ain't gonna happen. <laughs> no, no, okay. No, nah, Jalen. No, nah, this is the thing about the dunk contest. The minute a player makes one All Star team, it's a wrap. It's a wrap. The dunk contest in their minds is beneath them. There, it, the, really? the thing I would say about Blake, though, the why I do think he's gonna have great impact and influence is on the sideline in the locker room. I think what's gonna happen, he's gonna get out there on the floor, and you're gonna realize that that tank is closer to E than full. And the Celtics are going to figure out, well, damn, what are we going to do with this guy? And I think his ability to be almost like a de facto player coach, if you will, giving guys advice, giving them you know, insight that he has recognized after having played at a high level in the NBA for a number of years. I think his greatest contributions in the grand scheme of things is going to come in the playoffs. When you're playing the top teams with the veterans, the guys who've been there done that guys that he has played against and in many instances outplayed that is why i think his value is going to be most for this team because that if you think about the golden state series and you think about you know some of their tougher postseason battles they seemed as if they might have been one legitimate five to ten minute established veteran away for making things a lot easier for themselves uh, if they just had a guy who could go in there and give them 10 good minutes who was smart and savvy enough to kind of know when to push hard, when to pull back, when to keep the opponent off balance because they know how to play the game and they played it at a high level for a long time. I think that is what Blake is going to have tremendous value for this team. But if you're expecting him to go out there and give you 10 minutes and consistently give you six, seven points and give you five, six, seven rebounds, nah, it ain't going to happen. Because even as, as good as the Celtics are defensively, not having Robert Williams is a problem. Uh, because Robert Williams has the ability to help cover up some of those defensive deficiencies that a guy like Blake Griffin would have. When teams, you know, run pick and roll and they get him switched out where he's got to guard Chris Paul or he's got to guard, you know, Ben Simmons or someone like that, those players are reluctant to go too damn deep into the Let Ben Simmons shoot. <laughs> right, you're right. No, ben, that's a bad, that was a bad example. You just, when you see him, you take five steps back. Let him dunk on you, but he ain't going to go dunk. <laughs> No, he's going to pass. You know he's going to pass. He's going to pass the ball. He's going to pass the ball. Um, but, no, but Blake, yeah, I think Blake, his greatest value is going to be come postseason when they're playing veteran established teams. Uh, and that is great if you're the Celtics because, frankly, looking at your team and looking at your roster, you're going to need at least one guy like that. Even when you get, get Robert back, even, you know, if by some, you know, miracle you're able to get, you know, Gallinari to play some this season, which I don't think will be the case. But if you are – Having another body like Blake around who has been there, done that, that that's a definite benefit for the Celtics. Also, one more thing to note, he will be wearing the number 91, which will make him the first Celtic to ever wear that number. But also, Gary, you tweeted that it's a nod to Dennis Rodman. Did he elaborate on that? No. No, he just... Um. Pick no, <laughs> we didn't have a long conversation about that, Kwani. I mean, but, you should have. <laughs> yeah, kidding. but that was his nod. It's apparently his nod to Dennis Rodman. Uh, so he's wearing 91. He's already been photographed in the jersey. Uh, so, yeah, it's real. He's not. I mean, there's no number he can wear. Uh, I mean, they're running out of them. Too. Yeah, like he wore two in Brooklyn. Yeah, um, that's Red Arbach's number retired. Mm-hmm. Remember, they retired two. He wore 32 in L.A. Uh, that's Kevin McHale. And 23, I think, is uh, in Boston is Ed McCauley, I believe. 
Um, so yeah, there ain't no real numbers, and everybody else got all the other numbers. Look, so you can't do the combination thing because you can't do five because big fella, big ticket. You can't oh, wear yeah. six. Yep. So mm-hmm. yeah, you can't yeah. wear. You know, Celtics about to have triple digit jerseys yeah, soon. It's gonna it's gonna be <laughs> like five years. They're gonna have Richard like question more eleven. Question marks and hyphenate hyphens and uh, right. you know semicolons. <laughs> on the back of the, yeah, they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna have, yeah, sign. They're gonna, yeah, they're gonna have the at sign all the, all of our favorite symbols emojis. That's what's, <laughs> <laughs> and you know, the you know, weekly face. Blake needs to wear dollar sign. That's yeah. the, that's the one. So, winky, fa- winky face checks into the game. Yeah, lol. <laughs> we lol number lol. Lol with the dunk. Yes. So, I mean, also selfishly, I want to note that Blake Griffin is of Haitian descent. I don't know if he's the first Haitian player. He's of Haitian descent. He is. His dad is Afro. His dad's Haitian. Yeah, dad Afro Haitian. So, just got to shout out my people. Well, that's a, that's an in for you. Digging on that. That's an huh? for you, Kwani. Y'all can talk Haitian. Creole. Haitian. I, don't, I don't think. I doubt he speaks Creole or under. Like, I don't know. Oh. Okay. Come There's on, only one Kwani. way to find out, Kwani. Let's see how I much know. you know. You I didn't know that much out. for the record. I mean, y'all didn't <laughs> even talk about Haitian issues. That's true. Very relevant topic, actually. So might need to get into that. But before we move on, because I do want to talk about that blowout game on Sunday, the game one of the preseason. Let's talk about Indeed. No one has a business like yours with all its strengths and challenges. To succeed, you need a hiring partner that adapts to your need. Do you need Indeed? And Sherrod, I believe you have a story to tell about Indeed and what it's you done. You know what? I didn't, I didn't even realize this until I was like flapping my gums with my daughter. But the job that she got out of college, she found that on Indeed.com. Look um, at that. I, I didn't even realize that until we got to talking. And and, and yeah. So shout out to Indeed. Way to, way, to keep, way to keep my pockets a little thicker with See, her hand not in. Sherrod, what are you talking about? Your daughter got the job. She should get the check. <laughs> oh, but she's not in my pocket anymore. It's an extension of him. So she that's where's your daughter money at? Where's your daughter's money. piece of the pie? <laughs> where's your daughter? Where, you gonna give her some, your daughter some cash? I think what he said. She got is, the job. Yeah, that, that ship that ship sailed a while ago. And oh, it's, man, and you it's ain't gone. right. You ain't right. <laughs> it'd be your Listen, own father. This is not it'd, be your own, it'd be your, your own people. About. It'd be I, I, your I, own I, daddy. It'd be your own daddy. <laughs> See, but with that being said, that's clearly a success story. Shiraz's own daughter was able to go on that website. They probably use the instant match tool, which 80% of employers, they actually get quality candidates immediately. Of course, like Shiraz's daughter, very quality, qualified and quality candidate. Indeed match the job description. The moment that they sponsor a job, according to the Indeed data, they make it easier to start hiring. And it actually just takes 10 minutes or less for most small business owners to post a job, according to Indeed data as well. Indeed does all the hard work for you. So when you pay to boost a post, their instant match shows you all the candidates whose resumes fit the description that you have immediately so that you can hire as fast as possible. All you need to do, because we've got you covered, is you can actually start hiring right now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your post. You can go to indeed.com slash A-list. You can claim that $75 discounted job credit basically so you go to indeed.com slash a list need to hire you need indeed that's right oh, you need right. indeed yes. shout you out get indeed. that tax deduction off and on the payroll yeah that's money out of Sherrod's Young Miss Blakely you need to ask your daddy for some money <laughs> been there, done you, that. Young Miss Blakely you know what you need to do. Yeah, he just put the finger thing. He just did the finger. <laughs> right, right. You, you need to do you need ask to come out back. for some of that no, check. No, no, <laughs> no, 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 ask no, no, for some of that no, no, no. You're employed, baby. <laughs> you got the job now. No, 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 no. You using her, you you using no her to advertise. Right. <laughs> you are no longer on scholarship. I think she should get a cut as well. A cut, marketing cut. <laughs> She's Sarah, a brand like manager up Sarah, in here. You act like this Syracuse University, but you can be here for six years. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Moving on. Let's the move Celtics, on. as I've mentioned multiple times already, they blew out Charlotte 134-93 to 93 in their preseason opener. Jalen Brown had 24 points and five rebounds in 24 minutes. Tatum had 16, 6, and 3 in 22 minutes. Brogdon had a good performance for his inaugural Celtics appearance. Of course, Sam Hauser had 14 points. 
four on five from three. So overall, what was who was the person that stood out to you? Really, let's start with that. I'm going to say Hauser only because he's the one guy that has a very clear job this year: make open shots. Mm-hmm. And I thought he did a good job of that. But the the thing about him, and and I, and I talked to him a little bit about that today, was that Sam doesn't have to necessarily score to impact that offense. And, and I think it was evident in the fact that he was plus 26 when he was on the floor. Because he's such a good shooter, that creates spacing opportunities for his teammates. And you don't want to give Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown and Malcolm Brogdon space to operate. But you have to, to some extent, because of Sam's ability to knock down shots. And Sam, to his credit, made you know Charlotte pay in that preseason game. Now, obviously, he's not going to go four or five every game from three-point range. But the fact that you know he is that type of player and he can be that threat and he's not crushing you at the other end of the floor, which has been my big concern with him. Uh, so he was the one guy who I thought went into that first preseason game and did his job and did his job well. Well, I'm not going to come up with like a game one preseason MVP. Oh, right? of course. <laughs> We're not talking about MVP. We're talking about who played well, Gary. Damn. Yeah, who'd you like? Yay! <laughs> <laughs> I mean, first of all, Charlotte was terrible. <laughs> the Celtics had, the Celtics had 26 down. turnovers and scored 134 points. Like, if they had not turned the ball over half the time, <laughs> they scored 170. So, <laughs> I think I was impressed. You know, like, everybody, like, Jason got off to a slow start. I, everybody was solid. I liked, honestly, like, Noah Vonley and Fiondo Camigelli. I think both those guys worked hard prove that they can play some quality minutes for this team. Vonley is an intriguing guy. I just think, you know, he's bounced around. He's 27 now. Remember, he was he was 18 when he got drafted by Charlotte, you know, I think in 2011, 2012. I mean, uh, not that long ago. Like, I think 2014, something like that. Um, he, you know, he, he's looking for a home. And, you know, he's a local kid, Haverhill. And I just think he has something that they might like. I mean, he's he's obviously in good shape. He's, you know, fearless around the rim. He even hit a three. So I thought Von Ley, I was most impressed with him in terms of just him being comfortable out there, not looking to do too much. I think Kevin Gelly looked was maybe doing a little too much here and there, but I liked him too. I like I think both of those guys, obviously Kevin Gelly could spend most of the year or some of the year in Maine. As on a two-way, but Von is a guy that I think they need to take a serious look at. I think it just shows you like Layman didn't play that much, and the kid Luca Semantic mm-hmm. uh, came in, you know, later later in the game. It sounds like those guys might be targeted for more of the main roster, but I think Von Ley has a chance uh, to make the team. That's fair. No, I, I think this is a good. You can't overreact to a game against the Hornets, who look just completely disarrayed at this point. They have a lot of work to do, but again, it's just preseason. But what did you think about the coaching in this game? Specifically on the Celtics side, because I don't think we need to talk about Clifford. <laughs> it's okay. I mean, I, I didn't think I didn't think Joe did anything that makes me think like, oh crap, he's going to be horrible. Yeah, um, I don't. Th- think he did anything that made me think oh crap this is like the second coming of John Wooden uh he was solid I mean he didn't he, he didn't help he didn't hurt he was just solid I, I think but the tr- preseason is a good time for him as well because he's got to work out some kinks of his own he's got to figure out rotations he's got to figure out you know how to get a feel for the game and when to pivot in game and make those those split second decisions that can mean the difference between stopping you know a team that's going on like a, a 6-0 run from going into a 16-0 run uh, and figuring out just ways that he can impact the game. Uh, and it, it you know we we praise Ime for what he did, but you go back and you look at that first month of the season, it was kind of ugly. I mean, Ime was up and down. There were some games where Ime looked like, damn, this dude's kind of nice. And the other games were just like, yo, Ime, did you take the night off? Uh, what, what what's going on? And I think Joe's going to have some of those kind of, you know, highs and lows as well. But for him, it's the quick, the best thing for him is just to figure out how to get a certain level of consistency with his play calling, with his substitution pattern, with just how he does the job. And when he gets that, you can live with the results uh, because he will be, again, whoever he is going to be and is supposed to be as a head coach. Uh, but until then, he's just going to be all over the map, which is fine because that's pretty standard for someone 
uh, taking over as a head coach for the first time. And it's certainly understandable when you think about the circumstances by which he is taking over this team. Exactly. And we've talked about it before. How I think everyone needs to just give him a little bit of grace because this is a new role that was suddenly thrown upon him in maybe not the way that he expected. I think another good part about preseason for the Celtics is the fact that they are going to face the same opponents twice. So that gives them, again, even a grain of salt. But I think this will give an opportunity to see how adjustments are made, how they're able to adapt on the fly. Again, you don't get that chance to really do that in the regular season. But this is the perfect opportunity to just kind of, all right, what did we do well against Charlotte? And what can we do better? Because, yes, it was a great win, but there's always work to be done when you talk about improvement. So going back to that preseason game, I know we're taking it with a grain of salt, but we talked about who impressed you the most. Who would you say impressed you the least in that game? Dun, dun, dun. I'll probably go with Grant Williams. Mm. I didn't think he was bad. I just don't think he was very good. Uh, and again, it's you, you don't want to make, make too much of a preseason game, but I, I just I think every preseason game, when you look at the fact that you don't have Robert Williams. You don't have Danilo Gallinari. That is an opportunity for you to really assert yourself. And there's only really two or three guys that are going to galvanize the Celtics and, and just gobble up those minutes. And, and Grant is one of them. And I just didn't think that he was as, I think, impactful uh, in that first game as I would like to see. But again, it's only one preseason game. Uh, the, the Grant Williams Fantasy League owners to be relaxed. Your guy is still going to, gonna you know, <laughs> He's going to do all right this year, but I would have liked to have seen him be a little bit more impactful in the minutes he got out there. That's all. Uh, for me, I mean, there's no way really, I, I look at the numbers, nobody really played badly. Right. Um, you know, Jason Tatum was four for 11, you know, two for eight from three. I didn't, you know, he wasn't, he had five turnovers, you know, uh, so I don't think it was a sparkling game for him. Um, sparkling. You know, wow. Mm. Marcus right. Smart had four turnovers in 23 minutes. The problem was the turnovers. I the mean, turnovers. that was a game yeah. that was just kind of crazy. It was just uh, the amount of time. It could be a, a level of overpassing or just trying to be too unselfish, but I wasn't really impressed with their ball movement in terms of just doing too much. And, and it's the preseason. So you can, jump on them for that and be all, you know, well, they, they didn't do well or whatever. Yeah. It's it, it rusty. And, you know, they play, uh, you know, three more preseason games. And so I think they'll get it. They'll get it together. Um, and they got several uh, days of practice left before that opener okay. against the Philadelphia 76ers. But, you know, I wasn't overly bowled over with Tatum. I thought he took too many threes eight of his 11 shots were from three he had five turnovers but you know he's just trying to get comfortable out there he's just trying to get his win and get back in shape I don't think he's someone to really focus on um, in terms of a guy that is fighting for minutes or fighting for a job I mean it was nobody that I looked and said wow they just man that, that guy ain't making this team or that you know uh Justin Jackson had five points in nine minutes um you know, uh, I was I I was hoping personally that um, JD Davidson would play a little more. He played six minutes. You know, he scored four points. There was nobody that just bombed out there. I will say, but Tatum was not impressive. That's fair. Again, grain of salt. I don't think there's much more depth we can go into about this game. But game two is on Wednesday afternoon, evening. So that'll be interesting to watch against Toronto. Wednesday and night against Wednesday, Wednesday afternoon, night. evening. Evening. Yeah, I wasn't sure what, what day we were in right now. So when are they going to play in the afternoon in the middle of the week, Kwan? Yeah. Wednesday, <laughs> Wednesday, one o'clock. I mean, it's seven <laughs> o'clock in the afternoon. We're going we gonna to have to take a half a day. <laughs> we got a game. <laughs> oh, God. Kwani, I can't. <laughs> It'd be your own teammates. Don't let don't let it go. Just I could have just let that one roll. But you had afternoon, afternoon night. Something for it's like, what is the game? They play <laughs> Wednesday at lunchtime. He covered a nine-hour period. <laughs> Sometime between oh one and seven thirty. Thirty. <laughs> Sick of TV. Turn on your radio. <laughs> 
For H. Rob Blakely and Gary Washburn, I'm Kwani Lunas, and this is the A-List Podcast. Thank you for listening. Good afternoon, good night. <laughs> <laughs>